the recorder cut me off how rude so let's continue this here um, we were just talking about how when the tutorial membrane is displaced and we're moving the tutorial membrane moves in this direction right here then it will pull since this longest one the tallest one of these stereocilia is connected to it it will pull that one to the right and since all of the smaller ones of the stereocilia are connected, they're all being pulled to the right. You can see this right here. Now that ends up changing the membrane potential and that ends up firing X potentials at an increased rate. So you can see the frequency of X potentials here is increasing. Now the opposite would be true if we're moving to the left. So now this way. And now the tallest of the stereocilia is being pulled to the left. And it's pushing all of the smaller ones down into the water to the left as well. And that results um, in decreased firing of X potential. You can see this. The normal X potential is being fired. And the steady state or the normal rate of firing is this. And increased firing would be uh, over here. And decreased firing or no X potentials over here. So uh, depending on which direction you are pulling these um, stereocilia, you get more or fewer X potentials, which then translates uh, to information that the brain can understand and evaluate. So here, uh, just quickly, um, where the different pitch sounds are being processed. Uh, the low pitch, um, low frequency kind of sounds, they are at the distal end of your basal membrane. And then the high f frequency, high pitch kind of sounds, they're more towards the um, stiff region near the round window. We, generally, we hear best in the middle region. Uh, the very high and the very low frequency sounds um, harder for us to perceive. Uh, human sound is going up to about 20,000 hertz. Not quite as good as a dog. Dogs can hear uh, much higher pitches as well, so it's like dog whistles. Um, we also tend to lose, as we age, we tend to lose from the first from the high pitch and the very low pitch regions. Um, you need about 40, 50 hertz minimum to hear these very low pitch sounds. Um, below that, uh, the sounds are more perceived as some sort of a fear. And sometimes movies, they take advantage of that. They have these very low pitch sounds that we cannot hear, but we perceive that more as like a fear. Something's going on. We can't quite perceive it, um, but it adds to the suspense, I guess, of movies. Um, so here, one more time, the same thing. Um, so the different frequencies are processed in different regions um, of your of the cochlea. Now let's take a look at the auditory pathways. So as we just saw, the cochlea transforms sound waves into electrical signals, X potentials. They get transported uh, through the via the auditory neurons um, uh, to the brain. And then uh, we have secondary sensory neurons that then project to various regions for the evaluation. So we always have to cross the thalamus area. Remember, all um, sensory signals have to pass through the thalamus. And then we're going, we're ending up in the auditory cortex. So let's take a look at these pathways right here. So from both ears, um, the right and left cochlea, we are then going up ascending tracks, we're passing through the thalamus region, and then we end up in the auditory cortex on both sides. So from the cochlea, ascending tracks, thalamus, and then auditory cortex. And remember, we have these evaluation areas that would be for understanding and processing the information that you heard. Um, that would be Wernicke's area. And um, for the um, getting the sounds out, for articulation of sounds, if you want to respond, uh, that would be Broca's area, if you remember that from the central nervous system lecture. Now, um, a few things here about hearing loss. It could be conductive. It could be central, um, there will be um, damage to the nerve pathways, or it could be sensory neural that would be damaged to the structure of the inner ear. Depending on where exactly the hearing loss occurred, you may be able to fix that with an implant.
Okay. Now let's take a look at the vestibular apparatus. Uh, that is um, connected basically to the inner ear, to this whole complex there. Um, previously, cranial nerve number eight used to be just called auditory nerve, um, but now we understand more that it's both the cochlear and the vestibular apparatus, so it's now called the vestibular cochlear nerve. And um, the vestibular apparatus is mostly for your sense of balance. Uh, works kind of similar to the, um, uh, the to the inner ear with the organ of corti, but um, here we have an additional feature. We have something called the otolith organs. Otoliths are little crystals, calcium crystals, um, that are being pulled by gravity. And so you're embedding these otolith crystals into this gelatinous um, fluid in the saccule and utricle and then depending on how these uh, autolysis crystals are being pulled by gravity um, or gravitational forces that's the sensation that you're getting so these um, autolysis they will be pulling hair cells again in different directions and that sense action potentials and there you go um, then you have your sensation um, so we have um, semicircular canals that are projecting in all three dimensions and um, they're filled with endolymph and uh, with the semicircular canals um, you're picking a mostly rotational acceleration with the uh, tullus organ you have more the linear acceleration and head position either way works through um, the gravity pulling of these autolysis crystals and um, then the swaying of hair cells one direction or the other. So here will be the anatomy picture. You have the semicircular canals. You can see there are semicircles. And then down here, utricle and saccule. So let's take a closer look inside of how this works. Yeah, here's another anatomy picture that you can um, review your anatomy through. Okay, so here is how the physiology of all of this works. Um, you have this endolymph, and then you have this very gelatinous kind of um, um, material, and embedded here are the hair cells, and so these have also stereocilia, and then depending on in which way they're being bent, um, that causes more of your action potentials to be fired, and this system is pretty similar to the um, cochlea. So here, the crista, um, that would be, uh, again, your hair cells, and depending on which way they are being um, bent or brushed, they're calling it here brushing to the right or to the left, that sends more of your action potentials. Here, kind of like this um, picture, there you have these autolus crystals right here, the autolus crystals there. Um, <clears throat> looks like a graveyard of little rocks there. But uh, anyway, so these little crystals, they're sitting on top of this gelatinous material where the hair cells are embedded into. And um, well, depending on which way um, these crystals are being pulled by gravity, they'll be bending the hair cells either in this direction to the right or in, to the left, depending on what happens. So if you are bending your head backwards, then um, or actually here, let's start with head in neutral position first. So we have um, gravity pulling these crystals down and the information that's sent is sort of this, um, well, everything is normal. We are in upright position. And so the signal to the brain will be upright position. If you're heading, heading, uh, tilting your head backwards, well, then these autolysis, they're all of a sudden being pulled by gravity down this way and they will be pulling those hair cells, these stereocilia, down towards the right and down with them, and that ends up sending actual potentials that are then evaluated in the brain. And here, the pathway for all of this here, we're using now the vestibular branch um, of the vestibular co no, cochlear nerve, so keep in mind this is cr cranial nerve number eight used to be just called auditory nerve, now it's called the vestibular cochlear nerve. Here's the vestibular branch. The cochlear branch would be this one right here. Anyway, so we are coming here in um, toward the cerebellum, and then um, we're going to do a reticular formation. We always have to cross the thalamus, and then we're evaluating in the cortex. Moving on to the eyes and vision. 
So, light enters the eye, and now we have photoreceptors. Photoreceptors, they will transduce light energy into actual potentials, electrical signals. Now, vision is very complicated. Um, it's uh, not just light itself that needs to be evaluated, but you need to also make sense of these impulses and um, all these actual potentials and so you want to recognize things you want to evaluate if something might be dangerous moving toward you or away from you uh, think about the complexities of just simply driving a car you need to evaluate what's in front of you what's behind you um, if there might be any danger you need to recognize um, all the different um, parameters that are surrounding you so there's a lot involved with vision Okay, so anatomy review of the eye. I hate this picture. I don't like it. It's so... Well, I don't know. Um, anatomy of the eye. So please review as needed and um, hear more anatomy of the eye. Um, we don't really uh, need the muscles. You, I don't know. Maybe they, you had to memorize these in anatomy, but not here. We're going to focus entirely on the physiology of how all of this works. Uh, here, this picture is pretty nice. The retina right there, you can see it's highly vascular, lots of blood vessels going through. And more anatomy here of the eye. And um, the parts that are important for us would be the refracting surfaces, so the lens, of course. Um, then we have the cornea, also crystal clear, completely transparent to light. And the pupil will let a certain amount of light through. It will hit the lens where it gets re refracted, and then you're projecting an upside-down image onto the retina. Here, yeah, beautiful picture of the retina. You see highly vascular. Here's the fovea centralis. That one has the highest density of uh, vision receptors. Back here is the optic disc. This one is the part, we call it a blind spot because there are no visual receptors. Therefore, you can't perceive anything right there. And here, a first look at visual processing. So um, you have the information that's collected from both um, eyeballs from the retina of both eyeballs uh, that will be the optic nerve right and left branch right here converging and crossing or half the signal from each eyeball is going to cross over the other half is going to stay at the same uh, side get the optic chiasma and then we have the optic tracts projecting obviously we're going to go through hypothalamus i'm sorry through this thalamus region uh, for further processing let's take a look at this so here the neural pathway for vision on a lateral view um, from the eye we're going to use the optic nerve the optic chiasma crossing over half the information will cross over then we have the optic tracts uh, we're going to go through the thalamus region and then eventually a couple besides a couple more places that we'll talk about later we end up here in the visual cortex in the occipital lobe and here one more time from a different perspective so the information from both eyeballs is uh, collected the retina has the visual receptors on both sides and then um, the information is bundled up in the optic nerve on both sides half of the signal from each eyeball will stay on the same side so here we're going to go this way and the other half will cross over same is true on the other side half will stay here and the other half will cross over at any rate we're going to have to pass through the thalamus and uh, so there would be lateral geniculate body right here it's listed and then um, also the superior colliculi are also involved with all of this in the end everything converges at the occipital lobe the visual cortex that then evaluates evaluates the signals that are that happen sort of already in various places but they need to be still evaluated and put together so let's start from the beginning here. Light will enter the eye uh, through the pupil. Um, the size of the pupil determines of how much light it will let through, and that, de that determines on the intensity of the light. Uh, we do have some pupillary reflexes. Um, you can try that out with a pin light. Uh, if you shine that into somebody's eye, then reflexively the pupil will decrease its diameter to adjust for additional um, light that comes through um, the lens uh, i think we're just going to do that on the next recording